Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to It's All Black Academic live here at Jerkfest. Thank you very much to Jerkfest for having us here back once again. I will explain just very briefly again who, who we are and what we do. We are a YouTube channel and that have uh, honest and open discussions around issues relating to the black community. We are a year old and we are three seasons in and we have uh, dis discussions around a wide breadth of topics from politics to comedy, food, sports, mental health, film, and a whole lot more. All of our content is on our website, blackademic.com, and we're across all the social media platforms, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and Instagram as well. And if you haven't subscribed to our channel, uh, please do so. The, the reception for phones is great in here, so you can Google us right now on YouTube, Blackademic TV. So, we're gonna have a discussion now around black British comedy. And to do so, I've got three very appropriate guests with me today. I've got with me, uh, host of the podcast, Question Everything, and comic comedian writer, Dane Baptiste. Get a round of applause, Dane, please. Get some love for Dane. Thank you, everybody. To my far left, I've got stand-up comic, Tanya Moore. Get some love for Tanya, please. And to my direct left, I've got Sarah Asante, who is the head commissioner for comedy at the BBC. Not head. I'm going to say head. S senior, senior, the newest, the newest. Okay, we'll go with that. Um, so, let's, let's kick off. I'm going to start by asking all three of you guys, historically, what's your favourite comedy show or comedian, and why? Let's start with you, Tanya. Oh, man, you saw me thinking and you came to me. I did, straight away, I'm putting that's, it on you. That's mean. Uh, well, show, definitely The Real McCoy, because okay. we haven't had anything else like it since, really. Um, um, and I can't see us having anything like it again, unless we create our own TV channel. But um, comedian, I'm gonna go with Angie Lamar if we're gonna go black British female. And I'm right here, Tanya, I am right here. <laughs> all, right. <laughs> all, right. Uh, all right, all right. Well, that's I mean, awkward. Uh, I'm still gonna go with Angie Lamar. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> no, but Angie Lamar, she speaks to me. She's from where I'm from. We've been through similar life challenges and just her whole career, the arc of it. That if I could, if I could copy that a little bit, that'd be awesome. Angie Lamar, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Sarah, the first to ask you, your historically your favorite comedy show and comedian, who would it be and why? I think historically my favorite comedy show is Desmond's. Mm. Because I love, love, love Desmond's from that theme tune. Yes. Don't touch my soccer. I loved just the the vibe of the show, the family nature of the show, the multi generational aspect of the show. I love that Ghanaian brother was represented as Matthew, the ever, forever student, which is very, very real in every Ghanaian household. Um, and my favorite comic, um, I'd say, is. I really love comedy actors, and yeah. I'll start with Felix Dexter, okay, because he did something really special in terms of embodying lots and lots of black archetypes. He was the first person that I thought really opened the door to what, if anyone else tried it, would be called black stereotypes, mm -hmm. but he made very recognizable Caribbean and African characters come to life and I just love you know I loved his bravery because he did it at a time when no one else was really touching that apart from Lenny obviously um, but he he just did it in a way that had a freshness and a cheekiness and a I don't think he really cared if it was mainstream there was a little twinkle in his eye about the way he went about things so Felix and Dexter for me, um, Dexter and Desmond's for me I hear that Dane same question to you uh, it's, it's a hard question and uh I struggle to answer it, not because I've had a lot of rum, but it's hard to choose one thing because some, so many of the shows are good for different reasons. So, like, I would have a similar answer. So, within comedy, you have, like, comedy entertainment, which is, like, sketch stuff, like The Real McCoy. And then you have your sitcoms, like The Desmond. So, I'd say I like both of those. So far as a favourite comedian, it's a hard one. Even though I was, like, I've been facetious, but it's a hard one because some comedians, I like different comedians for different reasons. So, it, like, it feels like, gun to my head, I'd say my favourite comic and the reason why I do comedy is Chris Rock because I saw him when I was 15 and once I saw it I was like this is what I want to do but I feel like I'm a lot more enthused and inspired by the people I work with on a regular basis because when you're actually in the game and you see other people working and how they grow it's a lot more inspiring so I'd say yeah a push Chris Rock would be my favorite comic but uh, yeah just working with everybody and, and kind of whole pushing the whole who's pushing the whole envelope I enjoy so try to be cool with everybody it's good for business 
So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so one of the reasons, um, Sarah, as to why we decided to have a discussion around black comedy and black British comedy in particular is because I was talking to my production team about this, the fact that I miss Real McCoy, I really miss it, and I don't see any, I don't see enough black comedy and comics out there um, with the profile of a show like that. And then they inform me that there are shows out there that do have black comics and there are black comedy shows. They're just not maybe as obvious as the real McCoy was on a primetime BBC Two slot. Um, am I right to be saying that there's not a lot out there or am I just not being exposed to it enough? Um, I think it's a bit of both, if I'm honest. It's really interesting that when we're asked what our favourite comedies are, we're talking about things that are 20, 30 years old. Desmond yeah. is 30 years old this year. Yeah. So it's a real tragedy that we have this... What, seems to be a massive gap mm -hmm. and I think it's a little bit unfair because since the Desmond, since the Real McCoy, there's been Dane Sunny D yeah. on BBC Three, um, Miss Jocelyn had a show, Four Non Blondes was a thing, mm -hmm. Miss uh, London Hughes had a show, so there have been comics plugging away, chipping away, trying to cut through. And I think the reason a Real McCoy and a Desmond stand the test of time because there was literally no competition at the time. It really was appointment viewing. It really was right, eight o'clock, home, Desmond's. Whereas now, the shows that do exist, they find it harder to cut through because there is so much. And with all the streaming services and the quality that's coming out of America and around the world, Insecure, Atlanta, all of these really high bar comedies, uh, taking the attention away from the things that we're doing over here and the things that we're doing over here have got really decent bar on them you know one of the shows I look after is called Famalam and that has been a sketch series that I think has cut through because a couple of the stars in that show are social media savvy you know Tom Mucci who used to make a lot of videos on Vine he publicizes everything that we're doing he puts he helps us put clips out and I think by making sure that we galvanize and get a bit of a groundswell from the social space that drives eyeballs towards what we're doing on um, the channel mm -hmm. itself. And it's funny you said primetime BBC Two. Famalam launched on BBC Two. Yeah. You know, the Javon Prince show launched on BBC Two. There yeah. is room on primetime terrestrial TV for these shows and we're always looking and we're always plugging away, but cut through will be the buzzword that that's such a media term but that's a word for you the viewers and you outside of the media world will hear a lot because that's what we're battling with cutting through all of the other shows all of the other voices all of the other things entertainment shows being lumped in as comedy like the Mo Gilligan show if you look at comedy shows black people it will have Mo and Big Nasty and all of these things whereas what we're doing is scripted and it's authored and it just has a different tinge but an audience doesn't recognize that so that's the main thing but can through. I quickly well, add to that as well and I know you're absolutely right it's hard to cut through but I feel like Dane Sunny D's been picked up in America which has been bought yeah, by one of the Wayans and that's a cut yeah, yeah, so by, yeah, it's been picked up by Lionsgate where it didn't really get uh, yeah thank you one person that's massive that's Massive. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, I feel like it's continuing from what uh, from what Sarah's saying is that I feel like it's not that it doesn't necessarily exist, but I think a big part of it is that what people need to understand is that between Sunny D and like the real McCoy, that was a gap of 20 years before another comedy format with a majority black cast appeared on the BBC. What that means is that if you were waiting for your next black thing, if it's been 20 years, yeah. you're going to be like, well, obviously I don't go to the BBC because they don't show stuff that reflects me. So it's the question is like, when this comes about, we're all taught the idea that like, well, I can't go to the BBC, I have to go and stream stuff. So I feel like that lack of competence that wasn't there and that lack of awareness means a lot of people have moved away from relying on terrestrial television to yeah. represent them. Yeah. And I think that, yeah, it just requires people now to become more aware and get kind of involved again. Because this is what tends to happen is that like, for example, I struggled to get a second series from my show, so I went to the States and pitched it, so which is why it's been commissioned that way. In the same way that, like, you know, Jeannie Yashre is now about to have a, a sitcom appear on, like, CBS. That happened because she was overlooked for a BBC show, and that was the last straw for her, and that's how she ended up in the States. And even Reggie Yates very recently made a documentary on a renaissance in, like, black creativity, whereby, again, he tried to pitch a sitcom based on his experience. People weren't interested. Now he sold that to Get Lifted, which is uh, John Legend's um, production company. So what tends to happen, and that's what tends to happen. So, yeah, I just, I just feel the issue is... Uh, and I think that's fair enough. Yeah. Sorry to cut you. I think that's fair enough. I think 
all of this dependence and reliance on a Channel 4 or a BBC to recognise who we are and things like that, I think they need to see things walking out the door, walking out the country. They need to see a talent drain before they're like, right, we need to take this seriously. Because you get places like ITV that are unapologetically not representing mm. the diaspora, but then they have a digital channel that have slightly sort of more modern thinking folk there who will put on a live island and cast it in a certain way and put on a show like um, Don't Hate the Players, which I think was really, really um, cool and very surprising to find on ITV personally, um, ITV2. Um, so there are some channels, and again, you say, you know, the BBC didn't take this, the BBC didn't take that, but they did take Jocelyn and they did take Javon and they did take Family Lamp and they did take all of these things. It's Channel 4 that had a gap from Desmond's to Nort. They are yet to have an all-black sitcom. Yes, Mo's got a show. Yes, Tez Elias has got a show. Yes, Big Nasty got a turn. But in terms of sitcom, in terms of respecting writers, directors, things yeah, like that, it's not been a, a big but, uh, gap. That's what I'm saying. The lack, that lack, I feel that lack of investment in like scripted and uh, shows in more depth is because of the fact if you've not had a black show for 20 years, you're not going to have black producers, you're not going to have like black editors, script editors, writers and stuff. So the competence doesn't really exist. So the issue is not just who we're seeing in front of the camera, it's also who's behind it is a big part of it. Yeah, because so, there's not enough black representation in the important spaces, in the important rooms, in the important chairs. To, oh, just to commit, yeah, yeah, until many, now. Yeah, just to, yeah, yeah, just to, one just to many, commission many, stuff. Many, so. many is, is another issue, Tanya, that maybe in the 20 years since, from in between the real McCoy, sorry, Desmond's to Dane's Sunny D, is, is, is comedy changed for black people in terms of what we find funny? Or is it just your previous answer that it's just not being picked up on by executives I and bosses? Yeah, no, I don't think comedy's changing what we find funny. We've always been, you know, people... We're, we're the best audience, facts. Black yeah. people, we are the best audience. We laugh loud. We love hard. We give back. We give... We are with the... Look at... Even now, look at you now. This is a white audience. All of you be like this. We're the best audience, right? And so what I find sad is that I do feel like black comics, we're the same. I feel like we're the best performers. We're the, we give the most. Yeah. We have so much to tell. We have different stories. Like Dane was saying earlier in the earlier podcast, we come from different um, places. So our, our, our vision on even just being black and British that means so many different things. So we, I can have a lineup where it's all black comics because we're all going to have something different to say, yeah. right? Now, for some, for some reason, in front of white people, they're scared of that because it makes them feel bad, right? Whereas if you go to a white comedy show, it's five white guys saying the same thing, all wearing skinny jeans, talking about fucking their mums. And we don't, that's not funny. It's facts, it's facts. The white lady just said yes, it's right. It's facts. <laughs> And that's not funny, but that's acceptable. But then me talking about my history, like I was in Edinburgh just now and I did my show and a guy came to me after my show and said to me, in three years time, maybe I'll be like Andy Osho and stop talking about that race stuff. And I said, what race stuff? I didn't talk about race stuff. I just mentioned my parents. He was like, yeah, that stuff. Wow. Right? Wow. Everyone, it was a good, I love my show. It was a good show, right? Yeah. It's, I'm proud of my show. I love talking about my parents and my, where I've come from and what I've been through. It's great. So for you to come to me, and, and only a white man would do that with his face, self, right? Come and tell me about his feelings about my past. Fuck off. Then he came back the next day, right? Fucking cheek. Then he came back the next day, right? I came out my show. The man was standing right there with a post-it note of five people who I should go and see that fringe because they will help me tell my story better. Three white guys will help me tell my story better. Reginald D. Hunter and Stephen K. Amos. I took the note, I said, thank you, sir, and I walked off. Because you know what I'm not going to do is stand there and talk to you. Because what's scary is he came, in his mind, with the purest of intentions. That's toxic. Yeah. But that is what the comedy scene is like for black people or people of colour. It's a hard, hard graft because we can't even just tell our story without it being an issue or pulling the race card. But the white man can sit here and tell me he's had sex with his mum and I've got to laugh. That ain't funny goes, to me. It goes to Dane's point, doesn't it, about practitioners? Yeah. When you don't see enough people from a certain background, they get judged more harshly. You get told that wasn't delivered in a way I was yeah. expecting. You know, they've been sitting around watching multi-award winning YouTubers and then the first time Black Comet comes out and they've got a couple of dad jokes in there and a couple of dodgy ones and twos and it's sort of like, right, this is the help you need. And right. it's give people the room to grow, give people the room to upskill, give people the room to tell it their 
their way because actually it could be educational. Maybe you need to tune your ear into hearing it that way yeah. or hearing it with this kind of cadence. So, so let, right? me, let, me, let me ask the three of you guys about caricatures. As comics, the two of you in particular, is it possible to play up to cultural stereotypes without endangering our culture to outsiders? Totally. Go on. It's done in a smart way. I think Dane's a great example of somebody who does that, actually. Oh, now you're being nice to Dane. Well, yeah, babe, no, no, I've no, always no, been no, nice no, to no, Dane, no, but Dane just not got to ask for the niceness, <laughs> innit? You don't, <laughs> don't ask for the niceness. Wait for it to come, innit? Yes, this, is true, this is true. <laughs> this is true. This is true. Do you think it's possible to, to, to play up to cultural stereotypes no, I, I, without I, reinforcing I think the negative I think, ones from the wider I think definitely audience. because I think depending on where the uh, source is coming from or the narrative's coming from, it's not necessarily a stereotype. And I think initially when we... When you heard a lot of earlier comics discussing what might be now referred to as stereotypes, it's celebrated because if you don't see anyone that looks like you or reflects who you are, just to hear someone talk in a way that's familiar to you is enough. So sometimes just to hear someone speak in a Patois accent is validating because it's like no one on TV speaks like this. What I try to do in my approach to comedy is that like I will make us aware of pheno cultural phenomenons within our culture and certain things and then I try and dissect it because I feel it's very... Uh, as Tanya said, it can be very toxic when you kind of perpetuate stereotypes or you recycle them. Because what happens is an audience that's outside of that will be like, okay, well, yes, I always knew that black people are disciplinarians and black men have big phalluses. That's been reinforced. I can just leave. Well, when you start, or like if, we, if I make a reference to like maybe stop and search, then you may have an audience out who's outside of that and they'll be like, yes, the black men are victimized by the police. We're laughing about it. Ha, ha, ha. I've indulged it and it's okay. Once you start breaking down the structures that have created that phenomenon, then we're getting somewhere. So for example, if we say like, you know, like a simple stereotype for me, like let's say there's a stereotype like, you know, that black men are absent fathers. So we all, we're all aware of this, we're not like, but I would rather like, why does that exist? Why does that phenomenon exist? And I'd rather break down the fact that like, you know, if you look at like chattel slavery, even if you did have a family, that'd be taken away from you. So what are you supposed to learn, have a, where would you develop a sense of paternity from if that right has been robbed from you? So for me, it's like, there's nothing wrong with having the stereotypes, but I think to do effective observation in comedy, it's not just the what, it's the why. So to, to, the reason why I asked that question, Sarah, is because I remember when the Big Nasty show launched uh, last year, sorry. <laughs> I killed your applause there, sorry, sorry. Yeah. sorry. Give the man his due. <laughs> I'll get one at some point again, I hope. <laughs> I'll start again. Um, I asked that question because I remember when the Big Nasty Show launched about a year ago, the black people that I know, it split them in half. Because half the black people I know said they loved it because it was an authentic young black man just being himself and they could relate to him because that's how a lot of black, young black men spoke and how they walked and how they, how they carried themselves. But other black people thought that it was negative because why do we need to see a black person on prime time Friday night make p perpetuating the stereotypes that white people already think about us, that we all smoke weed and we all eat fried chicken? So that's why it's I asked that really, question. It's a really, really annoying topic for me because this whole when there's one, let's pick it apart mm. attitude is where the problem is. You know, if there were five different black guys shows on TV, look at American Late Night. Can you tell the difference between the Jimmy Ones and the Jimmy Twos and the Seth Free and the... I don't know the difference between any of them. They all have the same guests. They're all kind of politically minded. They start with a monologue. Like, they're allowed to do five types of the same thing. Big Nasty comes out and the man is being himself. If, he ha if there was a Mo show and a Tez show at the same time as a Big Nasty show, then you could say, right, here's a range. Mm -hmm. Tez is talking about politics. Mo is a very um, good, fun time guy. He's, a re he's like a, a host in the truest way because you have a feel good factor with him. Big Nasty is sort of a little bit more maverick and a little bit, is he gonna walk off stage and never get back? So he, everyone is giving you a little different flavor. I think it's really unfair that when one person is on stage, everyone, A, assumes people think all black That's how anything. we all are. That whole monolith thinking is very, very dangerous in, you know, in yeah. any art, but in that, any that, art but form. But I, I would say that's not necessarily our fault, though. This no, is the no, thing, yeah. absolutely. So, it's but, yeah. perception, it's societal Cause he, cause perception. That point, that point, look, and, I, and I think that's the biggest uh, challenge that most black creatives have to deal with is, is the yeah. fact that whatever you create, not necessarily from black people themselves, but a lot of the time people form their perception of black people based on what they see. And I try and explain this to like non-black friends, like when black people used to have to watch Big Brother, like it's like the lottery for us. Because yeah. we all know if a black person of a certain disposition comes in the house, yeah. then we know we're gonna have to deal with this at work. 
Absolutely. Because I remember, remember when there was, so there was a girl called Jo that came in the house. Mm -hmm. And I think she'd made a reference to me saying, like, I don't wash every day. And everyone, so we're all like, oh my God, yeah. no! Yeah. It got so bad, basically, she got a message from her family being like, there's a family member in trouble. But apparently, what it really was is that, it like, you can't go on TV and be a member of our family yeah. and talk about you don't wash. Yes, yeah. exactly. Leave the house. Yeah. Exactly, and look at this year's it, Love Island with all of yeah. this black cast. They're saying, you know, what's the boy? The, Ovi. Yeah, um, yeah, Ovi is, you know, he's done so much for black relations. You know, thank God white audiences can see that that's the kind of black guy too. It's really, really condescending. Yeah. In a show like Family Lamb, um, what we try and do with stereotypes, I think, is try and be a little bit more clever about it. Like, we've got a sketch um, called The Turf Wars, where we have the two posses that are video chatting each other, <laughs> and it always de escalates rather than escalates but then it escalates in a petty way so it you know it, it, they cover so much in those sketches and even with the um the uh the aunties at the functions with the tupperware you know what we're trying to everyone whether you're african whether you're caribbean whether you're jewish whether you're italian you know that women of a certain age when they go to a function need a takeaway plate that's just a thing it's not a british thing it's an american thing it's a universal thing so we take that African women be like dot dot dot, you know, uh, uh, um, a title, and then we answer it in what I hope is clever and recognizable and fun ways. You kind of answered it just there, but what's the BBC's, I suppose, uh, outlook on trying to source new comedy writers and new comedians, especially in a time when many are going online? So, do, how do you, how do you, the BBC, battle with? Online, the online world, well, trying to kind of that's obtain my talent. Area. My area is emerging talent. It is new, ta it is new writers. It is, you know, I don't look after the fe flea bags and the Phoebe Waller Bridges. Those girls will always find a way to cut through. I don't look after the Peter Kays. I don't look after all of these bigger name things. I look after the unknowns, the first timers, the trying to get across the line type people. And I nurture those relationships as, for as long as it takes in order to get them across the line. And it's I also run um, the Felix Dexter bursary at the BBC, which is a bursary that has one or two emerging writers that come and embed themselves with our team, stay with us for six months, go on placements, go in any corner of comedy writing world that they want to in order to get their head around what the biz is like, what the expectations are like, where they fit in, how it all works. Because there's so much jargon, so many hidden corners that people don't know about. It's not just a matter of, I've written the end on my script and therefore it's ready. There's so much, that's the beginning of your journey. So we teach them that over a six month period and we're launching that again this October. It'll be the sixth anniversary of Felix passing. So we tend to launch it around the same uh, month. And you mentioned Mo Gilligan earlier as well. Is he an example of a bit of a two fingers to the industry? Because he ha he's got his own show on network TV now, but Mo Gilligan made his name off of Instagram. He didn't get picked up until Instagram. So how many Mo Gilligans are there out there that it's are talented? It's probably loads. Like we found KOD when Hood Doc was doing its thing on the internet. Yeah. It got up to three million viewers. When we um, made Hood Doc for BBC Three, the remade remake of Hood Doc on BBC Three, our first viewership was about 40, 50,000 viewers, so we didn't even replicate the four million he had on YouTube. But as time went on, as the episodes went out, as people got used to the fact that, oh, it's not that thing from YouTube, it's a whole new series, people started coming to it. And Cody showed his stripes. The boy is a brilliant, brilliant performer. He's a brilliant writer. And through his relationship with the company that made Hood Doc the TV series, he then went on to create and write and star in Enterprise. So we like to open the door to anyone who's good, anyone who's a grafter, anyone whose ideas Translate and KOD is a great example of that going from internet to screen. Just briefly, off a wrap up, guys, um, the three of you, who are the comedians now that you guys rate and find very, very funny? I'll ask you at the top. Dane Baptiste. Dane Baptiste, here we go. You got there Dane in the end. Baptiste. <laughs> uh, I was going to say Tanya Moore. What a coincidence. <laughs> Madness. So I asked you historically who are your favourites. Who, right now, apart from yourselves, who are the people that you think people need to, and you want to go and check out and find out because they're doing it, they're doing it big? God, there's so many, this is the thing, there's so many people of colour that are on the scene that you don't get to see because we're not being pushed forward. 
So I would say anybody who's on the scene who's a person of colour, because we all are making strides, we're all out here, make, bang, we're banging every door possible, we're letting everyone know that we're here, and we're all fantastic in our own way, literally, all of us in our own special way. No one crosses over, no one's the same. So every time you see a black female comic, don't think, oh, I've heard this story before. You won't. It Her does, journey's completely different to it, my it, journey. It doesn't mean she's good, though. Who are the ones that you think are good? I'm not, no, I'm you not, can't I'm, do I'm, that, bro. This no, no. is going online. You're just trying I'm not, to... I'm not disregarding the You heard hustle. what Dane said. <laughs> it's good to be nice to everyone. Yeah. I just I, gave a really good <laughs> political answer. You did. I'm not, I I'm swerved not, it. I'm not, I'm I swerved not, it. I'm, I'm not doubting the hustle, but I'm saying just because you work hard, that yeah. doesn't mean you're good. No. Who are the ones that you think are good? That's very true. I think I'm good. That's the safest answer. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, man. That's Follow me, fuck the other bitches. <laughs> Follow me, I Shit, concur, man. I concur. <laughs> okay. apart, I concur. Apart, apart, apart from Tanya, who would you say out there um, people need to go and check out? To be, I'm sorry to support you, Jordan, but I have the same approach to Tanya. Like, I feel like for the audience here, there are so many people out there that you would love or enjoy, but you might not necessarily be aware of, because they're trying to play both sides and trying to br br break down doors and push themselves. So I would say, um, if you pay attention to Tanya and I, what I'll do on my social media is I'll post a list of a lot of the contemporary like black artists that are out now, because well then you can well find done. them well and done. check That's out. Good. Rather than you That's remember good. all the names, yeah. I can give you a list of people you can check out, because, like I said, black comedy in itself is not like a monolith, and neither is comedy itself, because you've got like, Black comedic actors like um, Coyote, as you mentioned, and like yeah. Tommy and Et Al. You've got like stand ups like myself and Tanya. You've got uh, comedy actresses and so hosts and presenters, but in, whoever but comedic to be fair, as well. In all, in all places, there's a black person somewhere representing for that build everywhere. So yeah. don't feel like you can't go there and you're going to you know, be alone. There's someone there who probably needs your support. Literally, to even, be if, fair. even if you're into Shakespeare, like, two, uh, so the act David Ajayo, who played my best friend in Sunny D, if you've not seen it, uh, cover your. Your, cover your ears. If you've not seen my show and it's not available on the BBC, it may be available <laughs> to stream. It may be available online to stream. <laughs> Although, if you're going to watch a BBC format, you should have a TV license. But just in case you don't, it's all available online on my YouTube channel. I didn't say that. All right, all right, all right. So these two have swerved it. Um, you, 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 you give me someone or a program that you think people should be particularly looking out for. Who's rising and really Family doing Lamb a bit? season three coming to you next spring. <laughs> <laughs> Starting with the Christmas wow. special Family this Lamb December. <laughs> wow. All right. On that note, any so questions right. from the audience? Any questions for anybody regarding comedy, British comedy, anybody at all? I will say one thing. Go on. There's a bit of... Sorry, um, young man. I just wanted to say one thing. Let's I get a mic to him not every comic, not every stand-up, not every comedy actor has a script in them, wants to do a sitcom. I don't think people should put being on the Beeb or being on Channel 4 as a bar to anything, you know? If you're out there, you're gigging, you're selling out your gigs, you're making your money, that is the number one thing, you know? I think you have people like Jeannie Yeshire who was cast in a lot of things and has been writing a lot of things but has been touring her socks off, her entire career, and that was first and foremost. And I think that does a lot in the long run to galvanize and keep you in the game and keep, you know, keep you enthused about being in the game because it can be disheartening, you know, especially at a company like the BB, you get a hundred ideas. Of them, they're from this background. Of them, they're actually quite good. And of them, these are the slots on the channel. Mm -hmm. So the whole whittle means that a good 99% of people are getting rejected. You know, it is a rejection game, but it doesn't mean rejection equals it wasn't good. It doesn't mean rejection equals we don't want you. There'll be a time and a place. Yeah, yeah because one day I'm going to be on Famalam, so we'll just leave that there. <laughs> the gentleman at the front there. <laughs> right. Um, first of all, thank you so much for like coming and having this conversation. It's been like great to kind of hear your opinions about it. This is probably a bit more about stand-up than like television productions and stuff, but I'm noticing a theme, a reoccurrence of like Jamaica versus Africa, Jamaica versus the world, all that kind of stuff. And it just it seems like it's not very progressive. I don't know if it's something that everyone else would agree with, but in terms of getting like them. from the stage onto like live at the Apollo and like TV shows, etc. What would be like your recommendation for like what other like comedic actors and like people do, doing stand up could do at their shows from like grassroots level to like have a better maybe representation as you say like if if a non black person goes in that room, what kind of view would they have walking out? Oh, you know this person's making a comment about their jollof and all that kind of stuff. Do you know what I mean? 
I'm very passionate about, I'm so glad you said that, I'm very passionately against every show that is black person v black person. I, for one, do not get booked for those shows. I refuse to do those shows. I will not be on stage, especially in today's day and age, going against a brother or sister for a couple of pounds. It doesn't make sense to me. Especially if the person who runs that show goes on, on the radio station Monday to Friday and talks about how, as a community, we can sit together. Brother, you're making money from us sitting apart, so I can't even take anything that you have to say. Do you know what I mean? I think what we need to do is do like what you suggested. We need to start doing smarter comedy because we are smart people. If we just sit down and do all these dumb jokes, I used to get beaten, I couldn't put my hand in the pot. Like, okay, we get it. That used to be the thing. Who are we today, though? Let's represent who we are today and who we are moving forward. Do you know what I mean? Yep. And so I'm very against... Jamaica versus Africa, or the Caribbean versus the world. Like, we're not, we should be together. Why are we against each other? It's yeah. so silly. Exactly. So silly. I agree. I agree. And uh, uh, following from what Tanya said, like, there was, a, again, as a time, I understand the reason why a show like that would need to exist. Just for people to, like, highlight and celebrate what the differences are. But like you said, we're in a new time now. My only recommendation I can say is to lead by example. So for my material, when I first started doing comedy, I wanted to make it a point of principle to be aware of the fact that while if you live in London or you live in like a metropolitan city like Manchester or Bristol, as a uh, black person, you might be a bit more spoiled for cultural um, references than if you're a black person. If you live in Derby or you live in Norwich or you live in Scotland, you don't have the same kind of cultural references. Like for most of us who live in London, you know where you can go to get your hair cut, where you can go to get a certain type of food. If you live in Glasgow, you don't have that same kind of opportunity. So I always wanted to make my comedy something whereby I wanted to discuss the black experience, but not make it so nuanced that it's not accessible to somebody. Like for me, it was a big deal whereby like a Nigerian person can watch my, watch my comedy and they can identify with it. With a Jamaican person, because my family's from Grenada, and if you're Caribbean, you know obviously that's a very distinct culture unto itself. So I want to make sure it's accessible to everyone. And so I feel like if you are creative and you are just trying to create stuff that everyone can relate to, I would say it's like, yeah, have a focus on celebrating what make, brings us together rather than what kind of divides us. And also, yeah, just having a sense of uh, critical thought where it's like, you know, I understand, again, going back to what I said before, you can talk about like, we get beatings, it's fine, but we've already had that, this conversation. We should be discussing if, you know, how can we like work out why people are beaten or how can we address how people can deal with that kind of trauma? Because now on the mainstream and predominantly white circles, the narrative is all about like dealing with mental health like, there are more people suffering with mental health issues in the, in the borough of Lambeth than the entire continent of Europe. So we're already going through stuff as black people, and comedy is supposed to be tragedy plus timing. And that's one of the reasons why, as Tanya said, we laugh with such, like, gusto. The reason why we do so well in comedy is because, if I'm honest, no one needs to laugh more than us. <laughs> so, yeah, so I try to make it a point whereby taking, these, taking elements of our experience and trying to yeah, advance those is more what to do. So I feel like it's just lead by example. So, yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, thank you very much, Dane. So for those that are interested, we did have a discussion on season one of It's All Black Academic, which Dane was on, um, around the issue of is there a line when it comes to comedy? And that was a great discussion as well. I wanted to get into that tonight, today as well, but we ran out of time. Um, but for now, I want to say a big thank you to Dane, Sarah, and Tanya for joining me. Can we get a big round of applause for our thank panelists, you. please? And, Thank and you, guys, and please check out... Me and Tanya got stuff online. I'm on all your good socials. Check out some stuff online. I was just going to say free. that. It's <laughs> free. It's free. No, wait, hold on. Are you going to post our names online? Yes, we yeah, will Yeah, because my dad's Jamaican. There's more letters than needs to be. So have a look at <laughs> what my name is, and then we'll go from there. So free. <laughs> you can go direct, but if not, we'll be posting all the guys' uh, it's socials and handles across our socials. We're on Instagram. It's all.blackademic. Um, and our website, for all of our centerpiece of our shows and our content, blackademic.com. That's blackademic with no Cs. Go check out our content, all of our work and live shows so far. Um, have a great day today, guys. Eat lots of food, drink lots of drink. There's some partying later on as well so you know scan out a little bit later on as well and have a really good time thanks for joining us thank you very much guys thank you yeah man my vibes are up here at jerk fest but enough of that if you enjoyed that last show i know that i did check out more of our content on blackademic.com we've got content here we've got content there it's all over the place check us out blackademic.com enjoy it